Cain said, I'm going to bring the works of my hands. This is the mistake Adam made in the garden. After he had sinned, he tried to cover over his own nakedness with the leaves and God said, that is insufficient. And instead of rebuking him, <laughs> instead of saying, Cain, you know what? This, this, this sacrifice is just totally off base. Um, how dare you do this? God doesn't do that. You see God take this role of an encouragement. How does he do that? Well, he inspires him to spiritual growth through two means. Number one is a rebuke. But number two is a reassurance. He says to Cain, <clears throat> Cain, look, if you do what is right, what has been taught to you, if you take seriously my commands, will you not be accepted? Say, so Cain, you missed the mark here. So I want to encourage you that if you make this right, things between you and I will be right. And that gives this, this young man this opportunity to be reassured. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm one who needs that reassurance. You know, there are days when I wake up and I think to myself, Lord, I know that you love me, but I don't know why. Because I know me, and I know the mistakes that I make on a regular basis. And I know um, my, the wickedness that dwells in my own heart. You know, one of the things that I struggle with, and this is just me being honest, is forgiveness. And you might say, how is it that you, a pastor, struggle with the issue of forgiveness when you stand in front of people and, and talk about the grace of God which we receive forgiveness in? How is it you struggle with that? I know it's wicked. But that's why I need the grace of God more and more every single day. And I need to be reassured that, that though there are times that I am faithless, God is always faithful. Isn't that what the scripture says? A child needs to be reassured of that. Me, God's child, needs to be reassured of that. And there are some of you here today that need to be reassured. You need to be encouraged. That though you make a mistake, God has not abandoned you. There is this doctrine that goes around that says that you can lose your salvation. Uh, there are guys um, that I know here in town that passionately believe this. And man, do they love Jesus. So it's not a question of whether they love Jesus, but they believe they can lose their salvation. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll ask the question, how is it that you can come to this idea that, I can't, that you can't lose your salvation? My question to them is, how is it that you come to the understanding that you can? Because when I read in the Bible, what I read is this. I read that Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Yes, my sin has left a crimson stain, but he has washed me white as snow. And what did I do to earn that? Not one thing. Not one thing. By me accepting that gift? Is that me earning that? No. That's just me receiving this incredible gift that has been given to me. And, and for me, that my salvation is totally dependent upon Him, that is reassuring. And for you, I want to encourage you with that. You are going to blow it. You are going to fall it. And you are going to make mistakes. You are going to sin. Let's just be honest. But when you do, the Bible tells us in 1 John, if we will confess our sin, He, Jesus, is faithful. And He will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not dependent upon my faithfulness. It's dependent upon His. That's what Jesus can say from the cross. It is finished. Paid in full. There's nothing that I can add to it. And when I try to add to it, it's blasphemy. Now, does that mean that I shouldn't serve the Lord? No but not to earn anything. I serve the Lord because I love Him. I had this great conversation with Don yesterday when we were talking about um, the, the different ways that we, that we view um, serving the Lord. And uh, we both shared a common experience where we said, you know, there was this time in our life where we, we did the Christian things because we thought that was what we had to do to be a good Christian. What did that mean? Be pray. I have to do that because to be a good Christian, I got to do it. 
And please don't hear me say, don't pray. That's not what I'm saying. We, we both felt like there was this time in our lives where we, we had to read a certain amount of scripture because that's what good Christians do, or, or go on mission trips, or, or give, or, and you can add to the list, but uh, by uh, living our life in that way, we really missed it because it's not about what we can do for God, it's about what He has done for us, and because what He has done for us is so absolutely incredible. It has filled our hearts with this love for Him that we just want to be with Him. So to serve is an act of love rather than an act of obedience. I serve because I get to. I pray because He's welcomed me into His presence and I can't express how overjoyed I am that the King of Kings wants to meet with me. And that blows my mind every time I think about it because I know me. But it also shows me how loved I really am, even though I don't deserve it. God has called the parent to encourage. I think back when I was a kid, uh, my dad coached me in a lot of sports. And the sporting event or the sporting practice, I never had a problem with that. I was always pretty good at every sport I played. The problem I had was the ride home. Because I might think, man, I had a great game. I went three for four, I had four RBIs. I pitched that day, struck out nine guys. I'd get in the car and my dad would be like, well, uh, you struck out once, uh, you made two errors, and you didn't encourage your teammates. Like, I had a great game. You know, why are you just pointing out the flaws? Well, in a weird way, he was encouraging me because he knew his son more than his son himself. What he knew his son struggled with was pride. So instead of inflating that ego, he would say, well, here's a couple of things that you need to work on. And that, in my mind, would say, okay, these three things you told me that I didn't do good, I'm going to prove to you that you're wrong the next game. And the funny thing is, that happens with my daughter now. After a basketball game, and keep in mind, I never played basketball. But she'll have a good game, and on her way home, I'll make sure I tell her one good thing she did, but then two things that she needs to work on. And she has the same mentality. I'll show you. But it's a form of encouragement. God did the very same thing with Cain. He says, Cain, if you bring the proper sacrifice, will you not be accepted? The answer is yes, you will be. And he says, be assured, if you do what's right, it will be accepted. Who is the greatest encourager to your family right now? Is it somebody outside your home or is it you? And keep in mind, encouragement doesn't just mean everybody gets a trophy. That's not what I'm talking about. Are you one who loves your family enough to say, this is the right path. This is the direction you need to walk. Here's something really good that you did, but here's a couple of areas that I want to encourage you to walk closer with Jesus in. Is that encouraging you? Because your husband, your wife, your children, they need that. For you, and for you who don't have kids, your friends need that. They need you to love them enough to be pouring into their life in such a way that you can point out the good that they are doing, but reassure them that when they make a mistake, God will welcome them back. And finally, <clears throat> we pick up um, the last portion. Um, God has called us to instruct, to encourage, but also to discipline. Let's pick it up in verse 8. It says, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and have been driven from the ground, which opens its mouth to receive your brother's blood. 
When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crop for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be um, hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of God, east of Eden. What we see here is God has instructed Cain and Abel. He has encouraged Cain and Abel. He has done both of these through his, his, their parents and by himself. He has acted sovereignly in their life. But then there's the last part of parenting. This is the tough part, discipline. And discipline's necessary in this case because we see that Cain uh, not only ignored instruction and not only uh, uh, denied any encouragement, he pressed on in the sin. And broke God's clear command and he took his brother's life. And discipline was necessary. And we see the Lord step in. And, and the Lord steps in for this purpose. To craft a godly character. And that is delivered or developed through discipline. But here's the thing about discipline. <clears throat> discipline is never punitive. It's always restorative. Whenever we see discipline take place in the Bible, it is never punitive. It is never a holding on to a grudge or a putting forth an agenda. It is always purpose to restore that individual. The same thing's true with Cain. There were consequences for what Cain did. Yes, he, he took his brother's life. He lied to God's face. And God called him out on it. God says, where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? And God's like, yeah, you are. There's a lesson in that for us, too. But he goes on and he says, uh, because of this, there are consequences. And I think we need to learn something from that principle as well. Playing with sin has consequences. Some of us, I think, in this room, we play with sin as if it will never catch up to us. And the Bible says, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. You guys who struggle with pornography, okay, and nobody knows, somebody does know. I just heard a story this week of a, a, a leader in a church. He wasn't a pastor or anything, but he was a leader in this church. Got busted um, hardcore with his pornography addiction by his 16-year-old son. You talk about a bad day. Okay. There are consequences for our sin. Consequences for our sin uh, and how we treat people. When we look down on others. There's consequences for that. And, and God is saying this to Cain. There are consequences for your actions. But these consequences are to build you up, to, to turn you from the course that you're on and back to a walk with me. And there are a lot of people that will look at Cain's story and say, look, Cain sinned. God was done with him. He banished him. His, his father had been uh, banished from the Garden of Eden. And now Cain is cast out too. God was just done with him. He should have learned his lesson, but that's not to read the whole story because the story goes on and, it's, uh, and Cain is worried and he's like, God, I can't deal with this curse. And, uh, people are going to know what I did. Yeah, they are going to know what you did. And people are going to try to kill me. Uh, yeah, they might kill you or try to kill you, but I'm going to put my mark on you. You see, Cain commit one of the most heinous acts. Sometimes people say, uh, this was the first murder. It's not the first murder. The first murder was, or came as a result of a deception in the garden. So he robbed Adam and Eve of eternal life. It's murder. You see, Abel, or Cain, follow suit. But even in that, you see God place his mark on Cain. It's this beautiful mark of grace. It says, Whoever sees this mark will know that my hand is upon you. Though you did this incredible wickedness, 